farts out CO2 and it poops out alcohol. It's a very right. technical process. <laughs> There's your Uber ride back to the airport. Awesome! All right, I've everybody give her a hug. We'll everybody give her a hug. <laughs> That's right. Bye, Christy. Bye, guys. Bye. Go give her a hug. Have fun in Connecticut. something different with them that you wouldn't normally experience. Yeah. Once in a lifetime opportunity. That's right. right. We've got everything hooked up. We say goodbye to Christy. It's time to go. New York's fun and all. Cities are fun and all. But I always look forward to going back to the country. Today we're doing that. Going to Con Connecticut. Gonna go see John. Becky help me with his last name. Sue Kochevitz. Sue Kochevitz. Got a YouTube channel. Does chickens, does market farming, it should be good. Our contact in Connecticut got the flags up. We just had a wonderful dinner, an arm on farm meal, ham and salad and rice. It was absolutely delicious. You already fell down in the puddle. Oh boy! I don't have my handkerchief. Hey Jonah, I hate to ask you, but will you go get my handkerchief, buddy? Hey, they're in my drawer. Okay, we got one coming. Up, oh. my man. John to the rescue. Everybody, this is John. John, tell him your last name. Saskovich. You guys met, uh, might recognize him. Let's get down here and look <laughs> at him real good. You might recognize him from the YouTubes. Hey, it's John Saskovich. I'm out here in the field to discuss what two types of breeds I raise of chickens for meat on pasture. But mostly useful for my long sleeves to wipe <laughs> off dirty hands. We're just using you, buddy, all right? <laughs> you know, everybody's got a purpose in life. Forget about the chicken Mine tractor. Mine is clean hands. <laughs> okay, John, show us around, buddy. It's yours. I mean, I'm gonna hide under this umbrella with my camera, but. So I'm lucky enough that at the very top of our driveway, we have a great 360 degree panoramic of the farm. Nice. Starting down to the south, we have a five acre pond, which doesn't really have any good fish on it, but makes for a really great canoe yeah. rides. Yeah. Uh, Kate, Mabel, and myself live in our little greenhouse. Also fun trying to explain as a farmer that you live in a greenhouse and have people uh, understand what you really mean. Yep. I uh, get confused with the growing greenhouse a lot. The yellow house is the original farmhouse. It's 200 and some odd million years old. Uh, that was the first building on the property. This property has always been some kind of livestock operation. It was a dairy before us. And the original dairy barn, which the bus is parked right next to, <clears throat> we're converting into our farm store and our tasting room for our brewery. And the brewery we put up about two and a half years ago. We've been open for two years now. Uh, we're in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and we've sent beer as far as Copenhagen, other cities in Europe, uh, on the West Coast as well, the United States. So it's a lot of fun having a farmhouse brewery right on a 52 acre farm. It's a functioning farm and we bring a lot of those elements back down into the brewery for what we brew and what we produce there. Can we poke our heads in there real quick? Oh yeah, totally. It's closed, John. It is closed. But you it, hold the key. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you have a brewery, people will come. So Mentally the, closed. The open close sign is pretty, uh, pretty important. All right, come on, Brown. You guys coming in? Whoa, have y'all ever been in a brewery? <laughs> it's, it's first on the crazy. tour. This is legit, man. So these are old wine barrels, whiskey barrels, bourbon Woo. barrels, and we'll age beer in here for anywhere from three months to a year. Whoa. Add some oak characters, add a little extra elements to the beer. And then all these tanks have beer in them. We start the brewing process here at the, uh, the brew house, our little brew platform here. 
We make the beer here and then it goes and ferments in the fermentation vessels uh, over here. That's where we add the yeast. The yeast eats the sugar in the young beer, farts out CO2 and it poops out alcohol. It's a very right. technical process. <laughs> From there, it goes into either bottles or kegs and is distributed to people all over the Northeast and or uh, we were open here on the brewery. We offer tastings and uh, people come and kind of sample what we do. Our bottles start on this side, they're cleaned and rinsed, and then they go down the chute and they're filled with beer. They come around on the other side and hit this conveyor belt. They spin around here and get a label. That label comes out and then the bottles are here. We put them back in boxes and we ship them out to all our waiting customers. Let's get a good shot of this label here. Kent Falls Brewing Company. Is that a dot com for folks to find you? That is a dot com. Kevin okay. So for fun, when we go see your farm tonight, yeah. let's talk about the roles of these animals in the brewery. Oh yeah, totally. The, uh, we have a lot of overlapping elements between the brewery and the farm, and it's been fun to kind of mix those together and uh, make everything kind of work. There's a lot of symbiosis here. Cool, let's go see it. John, what's up with all these solar panels? So we have a lot of sustainable energy efforts here on farm. This one actually is super interesting. It's a solar thermal array. There's glycol in these tubes and we use the sun power, heat up the tubes and our well water, which comes out at 54 degrees, heats up between 180, 190 degrees. And we use that to brew our beer. So our Ooh. beer is sun powered, not only our brew house, but our beer itself is made with the sun. That's cool. Is that common or are you pretty unique in that? Uh, we're a little unique in that. It's a more, uh, it's a less common thing uh, that I've seen so far. I had never seen this type of solar array until I came to this property. So the property uh, back in the day was an organic dairy farm. There was always cows on the property or some kind of livestock. This is the old milk chilling tank and uh, old farmhouse styles, uh, a little more Belgian styles, Lambic styles. We'll brew a batch of beer and bring this milk chilling tank to the back of the brewery. We'll leave the top open all night and the ambient yeast that's in the air will inoculate the young beer. And then we'll put it in barrels and that wild yeast will start to eat through that sugar and it, that wild yeast eats everything. It eats other bacteria, other yeast, and it adds a really unique <clears throat> farmhouse flavor to our beer. So we're using the milk chilling tank from the old dairy uh, to create unique beers here on the farm. This is one of our rhubarb patches. This actually used to be bigger, but we spread them out throughout the farm. This year we're working on a rhubarb beer. Anything with fermentable sugars in it, you can turn into a beer. It's a lot of fun for me as a farmer. I can choose crops that will plant a beer around versus planting a beer around, you know, me choosing a crop based on their recipes. I can help develop the recipes with what grows well in our area. So our beer is very localized because root beer, uh, rhubarb grows really well here. We've seen pigs on this tour before, but not ones that have a role on a brewery. What's their job here, John? So a fun scientific fact is that pigs are the most efficient animal at converting brewer's grain into bacon. <laughs> I so like our, that science. So our, our, our pigs do a number of things for us here on the farm. The farm had gone fallow for a number of years uh, before we had gotten here and a lot of multi-floor rows and invasive thorn bush had grown in. I mowed it flat, but all those root balls, were, root clusters were still there. I use the pigs for land management where the pigs go through, they'll look for bugs and they'll root in the ground and chew up all the dirt. They pull up those root balls and get rid of the thorn bushes because then they bake in the sun. They do the land management for me. I don't have to use any diesel fuel. And uh, at the end of the day, we get really good pork chops out of it. <laughs> look at them picking out on the grass too. You guys are converting that grass into pork too. Good job, buddies. Good job, guys. Oh, don't touch the fence. These are little guys. When you'll be ready to eat them, John? October. Cool. They're here till October. Do you buy them in the spring, but you're in the fall? I work with a local breeder. Uh, we're all out, all in right now. We're working towards having our own breeding stock, but for now, I get them as piglets, and then uh, in October they'll uh, they'll head out of here. Come on, guys. <laughs> Oh, we've heard that sound before, haven't we guys? Been there, done that. This is our brooder with our chicks. They are ready to go out on pasture. <laughs> They've been in here uh, almost three weeks. They'll be three weeks on Wednesday. 
They also serve a purpose on farm not only for protein. We're a hop farm, we grow hops, and hops are a heavy feeder. They grow 18 feet tall throughout the season, so our chicken tractors are sized so they can go down our hop rows. Okay. And nitrogen in the chicken manure is very water soluble. So as the birds go down, they leave their manure, it rains and it side dresses and adds nutrients into our hop yard. Now, we may or may not be setting these up depending on the weather. Are we at least gonna be setting up the chicken tractors out by the hop yards? Uh, we'll be setting up the chicken tractors on another area of the okay. farm. Right. I have uh, actually egg layers over by the hop yard right now. When you say the hops are heavy feeders, for those that don't know, what in the world does that mean? Hops are heavy feeders. They require a lot of nutrients to grow. They're growing 18 feet of plant matter every single year because we cut them back to the ground every year. So they okay. grow from the ground, from their rhizome, yep. up over a foot a day in June and July. And then they send out side shoots and they put out flowers. The flowers are what we use as a flavoring agent in the brewing process. And this, the, and you guys are feeding them with your manure. Thank you very much. So not only you're getting chicken out of these guys, you're getting hops. Let's show you guys this. I really like this. I really like what he's done here. He has an optional outdoor area for these guys in case they want to come out and he's been letting them do that since they're about a week old. So I like that, John. You've had good luck with the, the nipple waterer there? I have. They train into it. Chickens are very curious animals and uh, they the little shiny piece of metal at the end of the nipple drinker, they take to really quickly. It's shiny, okay. they're curious, they hit it, they get a little water, there's that immediate response and yep. they've done really well on the nipple drinkers. That's good to know. So he's hung up a, just a five gallon bucket here, he's put it off the ground. Look, there's one getting one. There's one getting water right now, guys. So where'd you get the nipple waterers? Uh, <laughs> the nipple where, part. Where, where I get everything is Amazon. Okay. You know, there I found the cheapest deals on Amazon and as a farmer I'd be as frugal as possible and you know, <laughs> do what you can. And so um, it's just you just buy the nipple and you just have the bucket. I buy the nipple. Looks like a Home Depot I, bucket. I buy a Home Depot bucket, uh, you drill a hole in the bucket and screw the nipple in and okay. you're good to go. Replace them that every easy. couple of years and I mean uh, nipples you put on it. Uh, they say, they say, uh, 10 birds per nipple. Uh, I have 30 birds per tractor. I put in four nipples, so that should support 40 okay. birds, or if one gets clogged, you know, you're covered. Okay, good. We've seen one of those before. That's our mobile chicken coop. I love so, it. I, there's, there are a few things I love more than chickens. I don't know why, and I can't explain it, uh, but for meat and for eggs, chickens are absolutely a passion of mine. Why? So to have them moving on farm, it's just the coolest thing ever. I mean, the good, the best days on farm are when chickens are on grass. Cool. I like their characteristic. I like that we get eggs. I like that the the better we treat our animals, the more they give back to us. Whether yeah. it's healthy, nutritious eggs, healthy, nutritious meat. Um, so with our our management style here, we have a mobile coop. It goes into an area for eight days. It spends the first four days in the first half and the next four days in the next half and then they get a whole new area of grass after that. Nice. What are they doing for the hops? So for the hops, uh, right now, <laughs> they're just part of the farm tour, bringing people in. Uh, we run the chickens through the hop yard throughout the year. Uh, that's the poles in the background that you may or may not be able to see. Tough time of year where our hops are only about a foot tall but they grow 18 feet throughout the season. And with the chickens, they act as pest control. I've also had them up in our apple orchard where they clean out around the trees. They get rid of any of the thatch that's in there, anywhere where rodents might dig and then girdle the trees. So they keep the trees healthy. They keep the, the plants and the hops healthy uh, with their manure. They're adding nutrients. They're getting rid of pests. They're a natural pest control where they're eating bugs that might come their way. and. Uh, you know, it's another reason to go out and inspect the hop yard or the apple orchard because chickens require daily chores where those perennial plants might not require daily chores. But on a day where you might be doing egg collection, you'll notice aphids or Japanese beetles on your plants and you'll be able to do something a little quicker just because you've passively built in this kind of like check and balance system. Nice. What about this one that's out, John? This one that's out has learned to fly over the fence and uh, I moved him today and yeah. I spent some time trying to get her back in. Okay, look, she's, she's submitting. Of course, um, it happens even to the experts. The chickens always get out. They get out from time to time. <laughs> the best you can do is, you know, try to get them back in, but you know, that's easier done with a friend. You kind of got lucky there, didn't you? 
I did. But they, <laughs> they, they have no rooster. She got so into the stance. They're kind of seeing me as the rooster these days. You guys have a little love relationship here. Yeah. You you're kind of, you know. Sometimes you got to shake a, hen, a hen's boot. You're, you're kind of doing the job of a rooster, you know. The, the rooster's supposed to go out and till out the ground for the, the chicken, the ladies, and, and uncover things. They can't. And you're feeding and them, yeah, so I, I gotta fill you guys kind of have a relationship going there. <laughs> oh, and it's crazy with no rooster. They, I'll walk through the flock, and more and more of them. I've never seen this up until this this group of hens, uh, but more and more of them will become more submissive. And I find the more butts I reach down and shake, give them a little shimmy, uh, the, the higher my egg production goes. Right. Yeah. So I didn't think there was a correlation between what a you know a rooster does. You got to roll, buddy. But uh, you know. You gotta see a need, fill a need. <laughs> yep. And he's not gonna go shut him up. He's confident in his electric poaching net skills. And I reckon if you keep that thing hot, you're good. That fence right now is about 7,000 volts. <laughs> my, uh, my pig electric netting is about 8,500 volts. Uh, so we're doing pretty well with the electric netting. Are you serious about the volts, y'all? I'm serious about the volts. You know, we have a 4,000 volt minimum here on farm. If it's below that, you really got a problem. You got to assess it. Um, but once you're over 4,000, I'm pretty confident. We leave a trap door open on the side and we have holes cut in the floor to let manure out and to let chickens in. So they're safe, they have a way to get in, um, but that there's no aerial predators getting in. And then around the bottom, around on the ground, uh, that netting keeps everybody out. So we have the big poles because we put a coconut husk string called quar from the top of that trellis, 18 feet high, all the way down to the ground. And this time of year, our hot plants are only about this big. <laughs> so it, it, hard to imagine that this little plant is going to no reach all the way up. It's and it's going to shoot all the way up there and then grab a hold of that. June, July, it uh. It'll grow over a foot a day, uh, wow. you know, and each day you'll go out and you'll be like, oh, it's almost there. And then you'll come out the next day and it's hanging over the top. Now, what is the role of the hops in, brew in brewing, making so with, beer? With making beer, you can use hops in two different places. Uh, when you're boiling the grains, so there's the two of the main ingredients are hops and then grain, barley. The barley is really sweet. You're making sugar water. It's like making a big bowl of cereal. If you add hops early on, they add bitterness to counteract that sweetness. But because you're using them in the boil in the early stages, a lot of the aromatics and flavor burn off and yeah. you're just left with the bitterness and you use bittering hops for that. We grow more aromatic hops that have citrus flavors, grapefruit, uh, orange, or pine flavors. And you add those later as dry hops. And with the dry hops, that adds some of the aromatic qualities, some of the citrus qualities, the fruitiness that you would get out of a IPA or a pale ale. It'll send out like 20 or 30 shoots. We'll train it back to the, the strongest three to six shoots, depending on you know how old the hill is. Uh, train those up throughout the season. And then it's the flowers, the hop cones themselves. That's what we're looking for when we harvest the hops. We're wrapping up the tour, folks, here. Coming back to the Corners Cross Meat Birds. You gonna help them out? They don't always go back in, John? Not everybody wants to go in for the night. But they need to on this rainy, cold night, folks. Look how nice this guy is. Two at a time. They're getting so much love and attention from you, John. I love my birds. <laughs> I got I into, can tell. I got into farming because I really love what I do. That's awesome. And I love my day to day. And the more respect you give the animals, the better product you see at the end, the happier customers are. So there's there's benefit to being a little kind-hearted. That is a good workout. <laughs> yes. Earth gym right here, folks. That's why there's that phrase, farmer strong. Yep. Every martial, every good martial artist can catch a chicken, I guess. <laughs> you got the Karate that? Kid uh, training here, buddy. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> good job, buddy. Excited to learn more about that tractor right there. I think that's what I know you for. This um, meat chicken tractor design, and you wrote a book about it. We'll be talking more about that tomorrow when we set these out to pasture. Am I right, jo yeah. John? 
We're setting up where that's what, some of my happiest days on farm are seeing the chicks that were in the brooder yeah. go out on grass and experience the rest of their lives out eating and living a very healthy lifestyle. I get it. I get it, John. Those are my favorite days. Letting them out in the morning or oh, but putting them out to the pasture for the very first time. Mm, so good. So good. And you don't know what we're talking about. You think we're crazy. And, but I dare you just to go and do it, and you'll see what you'll see what we're talking about. The proof is in the grass. It's all about the pasture. <laughs>